On this episode of WTF, we are kicking off our preservation series with an overview of all the different ways that we can safely preserve food. Hello and welcome to WTF. This is Janie. And this is Ben. And today we are talking all about the ways that you can safely preserve food. So remember, if you like what you see on this channel, remember to comment, subscribe, and uh, you know, make sure you get notified of our content. It comes out every week. And this week we wanted to talk about food preservation because number one, um, grocery prices are going up. So you want to make sure you get more for your money. And how do you do that? Number two, I think it's just interesting to talk about the topic of, pre of preservation because a lot of times people have a lot of negative connotations around it, right? It's something that people are scared of, they're not sure if it's safe. So we wanted to just do an overview into the different types of preservation and then over the next few weeks do a deep dive into several different types of preservation and how do you do them in your kitchen. All right. now. I think where we would like to start, Ben, kind of, you know, just scientifically speaking, when we make a dish and we see food spoilage, what exactly is happening in there from the foods, per, you know, from, from a scientific perspective? What causes food spoilage? So uh, essentially what's happening is we are competing for a food source. Okay. So our environment is filled with microorganisms mm -hmm. that are floating around in the air. Uh, they're on our skin they're in our bodies. Mm -hmm. So all of these organisms essentially are competing for food sources, just like we are, just like animals are in the, in the wild. Mm -hmm. So all of these products essentially out in an open and exposed environment have some exposure to microbials. Okay. So microbials being yeast, mold. Uh, the second we start talking about foodborne pathogens, mm -hmm. things get scary. Right. You know what I mean? We don't want to eat things that are contaminated with salmonella, mm -hmm. E. coli, botulism, things, yep. things that can kill us, essentially, yep. if, if we consume them. So it was really important historically to be able to have food and make it last reliably so you're not consuming contaminated food. Yeah. And if, uh, if you know, anyone's ever worked in the food industry, you have to go through HACCP, which I forget what it stands for. but Hazard, hazard Analysis and Critical Control Points. There you go. That was like right off the bat. But I just remember when 16 I took 16-hour course. Oh, my goodness. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And kind of where the first thing is you, you know, if you're just making food, you don't want to hold it for more than four hours because after that, the microbial starts you know, multiplying at an exponential rate and blah, 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 your food becomes spoils a lot faster than you think maybe it would. Way so, faster. Yeah, and since ancient times, we've been trying to combat food spoilage. And what are some of the ways that you think, like, you know, historically people have done it, you know, back in the day, like pre-refrigeration or anything like that? Yeah, well, I mean, just full disclosure, people didn't know what germs were back in the day. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't know what any kind of microorganism was. It was largely, you know, spiritual or superstition. Yeah. You know, things that were left out and exposed to sunlight mm -hmm. oftentimes were dried. And that led to the first forms of preservation. So yeah. mm -hmm. sun drying, uh, you know, just aging and hanging uh, proteins, smoking. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, essentially that's kind of our, our timeline of preservation. So we have some dried raisins and, and bananas and, you know, your typical dried foods. You can find all this at the grocery store. We also have some smoked lox, which, I mean, it's a s smoked protein. I, mm -hmm. To me, that's something that's total contradictory to, you know, my approach to seafood. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so at the end of the day, we stand on the backs of all these people that have learned these things historically. Mm -hmm. um, and then it kind of brings us into the more modern age of, of preserving right. things. But before we get to that, mm. I kind of want to go back to no number one, right? The, yeah. the drying, right? So. The question is from, from someone who doesn't understand, why does drying make food safe? Like, I think that's kind of what we want to do with these. Great question. You know, a lot of kind of these overviews is not just like, yeah, people are like, okay, I know I can dehydrate it, but why does dehydration make it safe? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. So uh, all of these pathogens that we're competing for all these food sources with love physiological conditions. They love wet, 
warm environments. Mm -hmm. uh, and essentially, if you leave anything out at room temperature that's a fruit, a fish, a protein of any kind, mm -hmm. it's a wet, warm environment. Uh, and at the end of the day, we need to change that environment to prevent microbial growth. Okay. So uh, essentially, raising a, I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into dry, uh, drying, mm -hmm. especially in the sun, because I mean, the sun produces ultraviolet rays, which is also a form of disinfectant, but that, something that comes way down the line that people didn't even think about. Right. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, we are just trying to dry and decrease, uh, I guess, increase acidity by decreasing pH. So, yes. yes. Okay. So, so if you're a microbial, you need water, it sounds like. You yep. need some kind of pH balance that's lower than... Our body. So our body is typically at 7.4. See, I didn't even know that. And uh, we just need to push it a little lower to around six. Okay. And it's just that small change that's going to cause less of a uh, environment to thrive. Cool. So, all right. So we're depriving it of water. We're depriving it of the right acidic conditions. Are there any other things that we can do to control that? Oh yeah. Uh, so it gets ever more complicated. So uh, when it comes down to it, you can control oxygen exposure. Mm -hmm. um, so a r the aerobic environment is basically responsible for most of our pathogen, uh, the foodborne pathogens. Mm -hmm. uh, the second you get into anaerobic activity, you can get into some more scarier bacteria as well. Uh, but mostly uh, you can submerge in oil, mm -hmm. wax rinds, mm -hmm. you know, something to, to seal your product. Yeah, and we don't have any examples of that on the table today, but it sounds to me like you're talking about canning, which is a huge way for people to preserve foods. Yeah, I mean, uh, historically, the first forms of, of Tupperware were clay pots, mm -hmm. you know, and it was just a means to get your food out of direct exposure. Hmm. That's very cool. All right. So, okay, before we go too far, like off the tracks yeah. here, we got dehydration. We have smoking. How does smoking and curing? Well, we have smoking and curing here because we got the bacon, we got the lox. How does smoking and curing help make food safe? So, believe it or not, uh, just this is one of those correlative data that we have uh, from history. So I would have never guessed this. People in our past are so, I want to say, lucky and fortunate to discover these things because at the end of the day, without them, we'd be lost. Mm -hmm. uh, smoke contains nitrates, mm -hmm. and that's a common preservative for, yeah. for meat. So I think total, total coincidence led them to smoking meat to preservation. Mm -hmm. I think it's wild. It's one of the most interesting things about this. Yeah. Well, one of the co cool things, and we'll kind of we're kind of co heading in that direction, which is moving into modern day preservation techniques, especially through, you know, the addition of different types of chemicals and foods and food additives, some of which we sell here at Modernist Pantry in order to preserve your food, and people are often afraid of them, right? Because they're like, oh, it's got a chemical name. Um, and I don't really understand what it is. I'm afraid to use it. But then when we talk about things like nitrates or when you talk about smoke, like so much of it is naturally occurring, right? That, and we'll kind of talk about more of this next week, but just kind of how er, most discoveries were accidental and then we were meant, we were able to capitalize upon yeah. those discoveries to make our modern day foods. And now people are like, no, it's scary. But I'm like, but historically it's natural. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Uh, I think a perfect example uh, is s uh, sorbic acid. Mm -hmm. So I mean, uh, it's a common preservative, uh, and it was discovered from rowan berries, mm -hmm. so from the rowan tree. And through research and just total happenstance, it was found to have antimicrobial properties. Mm -hmm. The salts of this acid essentially it's a fancy word for saying putting potassium or chloride <laughs> or uh, potassium, calcium, or uh, sodium with a, a molecule, and it essentially creates a salt. Mm -hmm. And that changes its properties, it gives it a wider application, and it becomes one of the most common food preservatives that's water soluble, uh, doesn't have a link to cancer, mm -hmm. uh, and is safe for consumption. Yeah, and so that product becomes potassium sorbate which we do carry here at Modernist Pantry. And you know, we have used it actually in several different products. Actually, I think some of these products that we picked up from the store has it in there, right? The yeah. yogurt. Yogurt for sure. This yeah. is one of my favorite 
Uh, name brand yogurts I grew up eating as a kid. Uh, it's used for freshness to preserve it. Uh, it's great. So next week we are talking all about potassium sorbate and how do you use it in different types of food applications. Um, but for this week, you know, we're wondering what else you guys would like to know about preserved foods. So any questions that you have, leave them in the comments below to enter to win a $100 gift certificate to Modernist Pantry. So leave your comments below. Remember, $100 gift certificate on questions about preservation. All right, now we're kind of getting into the industrialization of food, it sounds to me, and how over the last maybe 50, 60 years, or maybe more, right? It sounds yeah. like really we have a lot of food now in the grocery stores and they have preservatives in them. Can you talk about, you know, like how and when the, you know, that became the norm for us, really? Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, a lot of these innovations were spurred by the industrialization of the world mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, the world wars. Mm -hmm. So the First World War, you know, hundreds of thousands of people moving across the world, they needed to feed them. And that was one of the primary motivators of, you know, the preservative movement, quote unquote. Uh, so really, fundamentally, the, the push for feeding people and keeping food good uh, longer is really what did it. And uh, the use of these chemical preservatives, I mean, granted, the word chemical is scary to people, mm -hmm. but they are derived from nature. So. Yeah. Uh, sorbic acid comes from the rowan, rowan berry, from the rowan tree. Mm -hmm. That was discovered in 1849. Yeah, which is surprising when you told me that. I was like, that's way longer right. ago than I thought it was. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. and not only that, it wasn't until like 70 years after it was discovered that, you know, they put a stamp on it and said that it was usable mm -hmm. as a, you know, antimicrobial preservative. Mm -hmm. uh, so that eventually became a synthetic process. And people hear synthetic, and of course, that's another trigger word. Yes. Uh, but really, it's it's one of those things that allows, you know, industrial chemists to keep a clean environment. So instead of running an industrial farm mm -hmm. where you're constantly extracting from a plant source that has loads of impurities mm -hmm. uh, that include pesticides, nutrients, uh, it it can become a, you know, more trouble than it's worth doing it the original way mm -hmm. than a more refined way. Yeah. So in all, all of these scenarios, it's, it's better to keep a laboratory condition clean mm -hmm. to create a synthetic food grade product. Yeah. So I want to kind of go back to what you just said about fear, because fear is r and really demystifying a lot of fear around food ingredients is it's um, is one of the big things that we do here. And I want to talk about, you know, you've done the research into for a lot of the preservatives, when people say like, oh, you know, I don't want any preservatives because it's going to give me X, Y, Z disease and it's basically the bane of all existence. How much of that is rooted in science and how much of that is really just, um, you know, fear mongering? I would say there's a, a kernel of truth in, in some of that because mm -hmm. uh, anything that you ingest has a natural toxicity, mm -hmm. uh, it, literally down to water. Uh, so you can overconsume water, you can overconsume salt, you can overconsume preservatives and essentially lead to hazardous health conditions. Mm -hmm. So fundamentally what we need to focus on is that it is going to be a very small portion of your diet, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully. <laughs> and If you're eating like, you know, a, a whole pack of bacon a day, I think there's, you know, there's more that comes with that. Yeah, the cholesterol will get you before the preservative. <laughs> uh, but at the end of the day, it is a very small portion of your diet. And it's only a small portion of the population that are going to feel these effects. So uh, it's not everybody that might have a, an allergic reaction to any ingredient. Um, I mean, it's an argument to be had for gluten. I mean, there's, there's allergens for everything. Mm -hmm. um, so at the end of the day, if you need to kind of take the good with the bad and not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, 100%. I think a lot of it is about just kind of being careful with what you're putting in your body, but then also not just shying away from something because you think eating one piece of, you know, bacon or something or your favorite yogurt with potassium sorbate in it is going to be bad for you. So what we really try to cover today is just give you a quick overview of all the different types of preservation that we have available to us. And I know we missed a whole bunch, so, you know, if you want to leave them in the comments below, you're probably right. <laughs> um, but 
when we're in the grocery store and we kind of living day to day, we are going to see preservation everywhere, right? So from drying, curing, fermentation, you know, to chemical additives, it's going to be in all of our lives for the most part. And we want to share with you kind of this different safe ways in order to, you can do it yourself or just to feel more comfortable consuming them. So leave your comments below if you want to see us dive more deeply into any of these topics. Next week, we are covering chemical preservation through potassium sorbate. So we're going to get back to that. And until next week, from here in the Modernist Pantry Test Kitchen, I'm Janie. And I'm Ben.